and welcome back. We've been talking through a bunch of concepts and problems in preparation for the AP Physics C Mechanics test. This is the 2019 FRQ number two that we're going to be going through. You can pause the video if you like right now and read through this, or I can just briefly give you the rundown. This starts out as a swing problem, and then you have a collision here, and then this block goes flying off over here. So it's mostly a conservation of energy problem. It's got a little bit of kinematics, forces, circular motion, mostly energy, and a little bit of momentum too. So I would say this problem is not that hard. There is a lot going on with it though. So let's go ahead and get started with it. All right, the very first thing I want you to notice is that if you have a swing, you have a height difference here, and an easy way to deal with height differences is going to be with the conservation of energy situation because you have height built into the gravitational potential energy equation. So it is true to say the potential energy that's stored in this first position right here is equal to the kinetic energy as it swings down over here. So that's what we're saying by that. And it's really that easy. You start off with mgh is equal to 1 half mv squared. Note the m's go away. And you're going to isolate for the speed at the bottom. And it really is that easy, honestly. It's not that tough. So that's going to be our answer right here. Note that they don't give us some of these values at the beginning of the problem. So we just have to leave it in this form right here. And that's what they're asking us to do. By the way, we will use this later. As is often done with these problems, the answer to an earlier step is going to be used in a calculation for a later step. So now we know the speed at which this block is right here, the instant basically it's hitting block 2, we know what that speed is. So we'll build on that information. Alright, and the next thing they ask us to do is just to draw a free body diagram of this object right here. Now it turns out that there must be an overall acceleration towards the center. This thing is moving in a circular path. And because it's moving in a circular path, there must be a net force towards the center. That center seeking force causes something called centripetal acceleration. So if it's moving in a circular path, which this is, it must have a net force going towards the center. We draw two forces here. One is going to be gravity and one is going to be tension. But you will not get the point unless you draw tension to be longer than gravity. It must be for this thing to be moving in a circular path. And next up, what they're asking us to do is just to solve for the tension force. So to figure out what the tension force is in terms of other things. So when we're dealing with forces, I often recommend that students work with something I call the sum of the forces strategy. First thing you're going to do is just write out Newton's second law. So the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Also, we know in this case, we have a special kind of acceleration. So we're going to modify the strategy just a little bit and call this centripetal acceleration. That's pretty key, as you'll see in a moment. The second step in the sum of the forces strategy is going to be to just list out what those forces are, literally the sum of those forces. So we'll call up positive and down negative. And if that's the case, we've got tension minus Fg. And what we can do next is just set these things equal to each other since they are the same thing on the left hand side. So we set them equal to each other and we're going to isolate for t. So we pull this up here. On your equation sheet, you do have an equation for centripetal acceleration. And I want you to think to yourself, do we have a translational situation or a rotational situation? And the answer is we have a translational situation. We're not talking about an object that's rolling here. We're talking about an object that's just moving in the xy plane, so to speak. And so we're going to use this version and insert it here for centripetal acceleration. All right, and so we go about doing that, and we've got this right here. I'm going to label this as equation one, so when I go to the next slide, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I've gone ahead and changed this to 3m into 3m over here because that's what they've given to us. For the first block, it has 3m of mass. And so there's our setup, our equation from last slide. We go ahead and continue. At this point, we solve for our speed at this point right here. And so we can go ahead and put in that speed right there. And we do a little more math, a little more simplification, and we end up with 9mg. Pause that if you need to take a look at that for a moment. All right, and for the remainder of the problem, they give us some more information. So it says for parts D through G, the value for the length of the pendulum is L equals 75 centimeters. So part D says calculate the time between the instant block two leaves the table and the instant it first contacts the floor. So block two is going to go like this. This is a projectile problem. So hopefully that makes sense and you notice that it's a projectile problem. What we're going to use are kinematic equations for this. And they go ahead and they help us out. 
Sometimes you'll have to figure this out on your own. You typically have to solve for time first and then solve for something in the X. And they actually make it easier for you because they tell you like, hey, solve for the time first. So you go ahead. This is a slightly modified equation that you have on your equation sheet. I've just combined the Y final minus the Y initial into delta Y. We go ahead. Note that this V initial and the Y is zero. That means it's not launched up nor down. That essentially goes away because this is V initial and the Y. And so we solve for time and we plug in our values. Note that they gave us the values now so we can start using numbers and we get 0.55 seconds for this. Hopefully that's an easy problem. All right, for E, it says calculate the speed of the block, too, as it leaves the table. So we know what's happening in the Y. We know how long it takes for it to hit the floor. We also know how far this thing travels. We know our delta X value during that flight. So we can use that same information to help us to figure out what the speed of the block is going to be. So figure out what this is going to be right here. Okay, and so note that the acceleration in the X is zero. There's no air resistance here that we're keeping track of, no drag forces that we're keeping track of. So that means that whole term drops out. And so with that term gone, we can just go ahead and solve for speed in the X, and we go ahead and plug in our numbers, and we get 5.45 meters per second. Hopefully that's an easy problem right there. Okay, and so F says calculate the speed of block one just after it collides with block two. Well, let's think about this for a moment. So when we know when we're analyzing a collision, you definitely have momentum and you have energy. And it's useful to think about what to use first and what to use second. If at all possible, use momentum first because momentum is always, always, always conserved. Kinetic energy is not conserved. What I mean by that is energy is conserved, but the form of the energy can change. So that kinetic energy can go into potential energy, for instance, right here. So it gets a little complex with energy. Momentum, it's a lot more straightforward. This kind of collision right here, we would say the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. That is always true. What I would call this right here is a two to two collision. What I mean by that is you have two objects before the event, two objects after the event. And so that also means you have two mathematical terms before the event and two mathematical terms after the event. You can also describe two to one scenarios or one to two scenarios, depending on what you have with a collision, a separation, a collision, like sticking together, that kind of thing. But for now, we've just got two objects colliding and two objects after the events as well. So this is our baseline equation that we're going to use for that. Note that they give you P is equal to MV, but then you have to fill out this based on this concept of like, oh, this is a two to two scenario. So I'm going to have two terms before the event, two terms after the event. All right, next up, we note that this V initial for V2 is going to be zero. And what that means is this whole term then therefore drops out and we want to solve for our V final. So our V final for one, I should say. So we start isolating for V1 final. I'm going to take this term and drag it over here. So I subtract it over and I continue with the derivation. I've got V1 final is equal to this. And then I'm going to go ahead and plug in my M values for this. So this is 3M right here. This is 1M right here and 3M down below here based on what they have given us in the problem up above. I'm going to label that as equation two as I flip to the next page so you can see what I'm talking about. And so that's the same equation that we had there. Let's continue. Now note we solved in part A. So quite a ways back we solved for what this speed was right here. It was 2GL at the time. We didn't have a hard number for that because they hadn't given this to us at that point of the problem yet. And so we're going to go ahead and start by plugging that value in, the root 2GL. But then we can also go ahead and put in some numbers with that because now we know that L, for instance, is 0 0.75. So we go ahead, plug in our numbers. We end up with 2.02 .02 meters a second. And G says calculate the angle of theta max that the string makes with the vertical as shown in the original figure when block one is at the is at its highest point after the collision. So block one continues through. It's like a golf swing that follows through. This thing goes flying off like this, but this continues through. So when it reaches its height right here, the question is, what is that theta? What is that angle? 
So because they have a height, what we're going to do is think about, well, that kinetic energy that this block had right here at this point is going to be equal to the potential energy that it has up here because energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes forms. So it has a certain amount of kinetic energy after the collision that converts into potential energy, we're saying. All right, so we know the equations for both of these. We go ahead and plug them in and immediately, like many conservation of energy problems, we note that we can cancel out the masses. And so then we just solve for H. But it's not that simple. There's actually a lot more to this problem right here. If you've never seen this before, I'm going to want you to pay close attention. This is common for conservation of energy problems with swings. Sometimes this is mentioned as a Tarzan problem, but you end up having to solve for an angle or something similar. So let's go ahead and talk through this. This is one case where you can make a strong argument that a diagram really does help to understand what's going on. Let's say you have a certain length, and that length is going to be the same value if it's straight down or if it's off at some angle right here, like it is at this point in the swing over here. All right, well, what we need is this height. So the question is, well, how are we going to get that height? Well, at this point, what we can do is we can actually just complete the triangle. So we have a triangle right here that we can make. And this is its initial position. This is its final position over here. But we can start to think also, too, about this as a number line. So I want you to think about this as a number line and think about for a moment, if I were going to make an equation using these three terms right here, what would that equation be? I am serious. Please pause and think about that. What would this equation be just based on these letters here? Hopefully you're able to come up with the idea that length this length right here is equal to height plus the adjacent leg. And if you can follow along with that, that's the major strategy. So it's not that hard once you've seen how to do it and once you become familiar with it. But this is really something you need to know how to do. And they will expect that you are able to do this on a test. So we're going to say length is equal to adjacent plus height. Notice I just made that equation up based on my diagram here. That's literally all I did. All right, so let's continue with that because we want to get that height to be able to plug it in over here and see what we can do with it. So I can say length minus the adjacent leg is equal to the height. That makes sense. And I'm going to go ahead and substitute in right here for adjacent. Well, what is adjacent? Well, that's the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta right here. will give us our adjacent leg. So that's length minus the adjacent is equal to height. And again, it's getting a little more messy. And we're plugging in what we had for height right here, down below here. But I do want to point out that we are essentially looking for this, right? So we're going to do a little bit of simplification here, like in multiple steps. But essentially, all we're trying to do is get theta by itself. So that was our equation from last slide. We continue, and we're isolating for theta. So we go ahead and drag the L over to the right side. We're going to subtract that 1 over. Next, we want to get rid of the negative sign and we want to get rid of the cosine function. So to do that, we take the inverse cosine of both sides, and we go ahead and plug in our numbers, and we end up with 43.5 degrees. So I guess I just want to conclude with, we are going to practice some more problems. Hopefully this problem wasn't too bad, especially if you have seen this before. If you have not seen this before, I think you should watch this a couple times or practice this a couple times. Look for problems that are conservation of energy swing problems. You might want to just look that up on the net and see if you can practice a couple of those problems to get the hang of it because it is something that you're going to be expected to know. So we'll continue with this, though. We'll try some other practice problems. We'll do our best to get everyone ready for this AP Physics C mechanics test, and I hope this was helpful.